Hi everyone, uh, this is Dattaraj. Uh, I work for Persistent and uh, I'll present this talk on uh, building a responsible AI system. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll talk about, uh, uh, I'll start with just giving an overview why we need a responsible AI system. Uh, what are some of the facets of responsible AI? And, and these are some things you probably hear in the news a lot recently. And I'll, I'll touch up on a few aspects like transparency, uh, 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 reproducibility, etc. Uh, I'll show how this uh, responsible AI fits into your uh, uh, regular AI project and how to include some of these facets and make your project improve the uh, overall uh, uh, your current AI project. Then uh, I'll show a case study. And now I may either share this screen or I, I have the results in the slides uh, depending on the network. I'll uh, show a case study of how bias affects your AI models and how some so what you can do, some of the technical interventions you can do to uh, uh, to uh, reduce the effect of uh, adverse effect of bias. And at the end, I'll talk about uh, security and privacy and uh, show talk about one particular technology called federated learning, which talks about decentralized uh, machine learning and uh, uh, how you can improve the privacy of AML models, uh, uh, privacy of the data uh, uh, using something like federated learning. And uh, so I'll go, uh, the talk will be for about 40, 45 minutes, and then uh, we'll have a break for question and answers. So keep your questions coming on the Q&A panel. I'll occasionally monitor them and uh, we can discuss at the end. Uh, hopefully we can have an interactive session and hopefully this will help you look at a different view of AI from the responsible AI kind of, uh, paradigm. A uh, little bit about me. Um, so I, I lead the AI research team at Persistent. Uh, I've been with Persistent for a little over a year now. Before that, I worked for General Electric GE. Uh, I worked at uh, GE Research, Energy and uh, Transportation. Uh, I, I'm also the author of the book, uh, Keras to Kubernetes, The Journey of a Machine Learning Model to Production. Uh, the book is pretty much uh, talks about how you uh, take a, a machine learning model uh, developed in uh, Keras, which is the primary deep learning library, very popular deep learning library, and deploy it to a production to a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it has been released a couple of years back where a lot of the newer technologies like Qflow have not been prominent, but a lot of the concepts in the book are still very much valid. I'm active on LinkedIn, so uh, I hope you like the talk and you can uh, we can connect over LinkedIn or in the Q&A session. A little bit about my company, uh, Persistent. We are a half a billion dollar company. We were headquartered in India, so I'm based in Goa, India. Uh, and we have offices all over the world. Uh, we have about uh, more than uh, 10,000 employees. Uh, we offices in Europe as well as uh, in the uh, uh, US. Our primary focus is in uh, BFSI, banking sector, and uh, uh, healthcare and uh, industrial. So you can see a lot of our customers uh, work with sensitive data, and uh, the aspects of responsible AI is very important to a lot of work that we do. And I'll touch base on some of that. So, with that, let's get started. So, let's start with uh, why do we need a responsible AI? Now, you probably heard this multiple times uh, data is the new oil. Uh, they say uh, the organizations, uh, not the ones with the best technology, but the ones who have the best data will actually flourish in the coming years. We are in the digital data economy and AI is the new electricity. So AI is the one that can uh, that will uh, let you build a lot of, uh, of, of outcomes from uh, data, which you with the amount of data that we are dealing with now, you cannot really expect uh, deterministic rule based systems to kind of uh, get you the, uh, the the clear results. So AI is the one that can process large volume of data and get you uh, statistically analyze this data for you. But at the same time, like Uncle Ben from Spider-Man says, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. So we see these, so these headlines also, like uh, a lot of bias in our facial recognition systems, uh, a lot of flawed algorithms uh, for assessment or even your banking loan system. Now, uh, that raises the question, how much autonomy do you want to give to AI? Do you want an AI to approve a loan, a bank loan for you? And uh, do you know if that AI underneath, how does it work? Uh, does, does it have any inherent bias against certain uh, uh, certain groups of people, which may not be uh, ethically uh, valid or ethically important? And then uh, 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 still worse, I mean, how much uh, autonomy do you want to give to AI? Like uh, then get the discussion gets into things like self-driving cars. Do you want to, how can, do, uh, can you trust a self-driving car, especially when there are uh, cases when uh, the cars have been fooled by, uh, uh, by, by putting stickers on signals and then uh, 
uh, making the car uh, think that the signal is something totally different. So all this, a lot of these aspects kind of uh, get into the space of uh, 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 the need for responsible AI. And a uh, lot of companies, uh, as you know, are uh, investigating and uh, investing heavily in this space. We have Google, uh, Facebook, uh, all the top companies, IBM, Microsoft, spending a lot of uh, dedicated uh, time and resources on uh, responsible AI. And they have these uh, uh, specific focus areas like AI ethics committees who look at how to apply AI for the good. So we at Persistent also have this as a major uh, initiative and an offering. And we help our banking and healthcare industrial customers look at the AI systems that they build and uh, see how we can make them more responsible and ethical uh, so that uh, the customer interest is always at the, at the forefront. So uh, talking about responsible AI, these are the uh, five facets of responsible AI, AI that uh, we, we, uh, we think about. And of course, the, uh, the kind of varying terminology, but at, at a high level, this is kind of how uh, most companies today see responsible AI. The first aspect is reproducibility. So uh, reproducibility is when you're building ML models. Now, ML model often tends to be a black box. Now, the results that you're seeing are they reproducible when you, when uh, like the old saying goes in the software world hey it works on my machine uh, the same thing happens in ml like it works on my data set but when you take a data set and uh, you test it you get 99% accuracy all the champions are out and then when you deploy the model to production your accuracy drops to 60 70% so why does that happen because the uh, the data set you have trained with may not be the representative data set of the production or your model may maybe training with uh, uh, maybe training on a data which has certain in inherent biases maybe sampling bias maybe confirmational bias and because of that your uh, your results don't tally with what you see in production so reproducibility is a major concept and the ways to uh, bring in reproducibility one of the way is to have a standardized machine learning pipeline so when you build ml models typically a lot of ml models start with uh, very smart super smart data scientists but they they have preferences to their own tools technologies python r numpy or uh, some of the other uh, scikit learn so they have their own preference to uh, the uh, the libraries and they build their own models now a lot of times the the feature engineering that is done may not be uniform and then when you build a model, uh, again, uh, because of the initial differences in the data, differences in the feature engineering, the models don't be uniform. So the standardization of the data science pipeline is very important. And I'll talk, I'll show an example of a standard data science pipeline. And now there are tools like ML4 Flow, QFlow, which can help you build a standard data science pipeline. So reproducibility is a very major aspect of responsible AI. Second aspect is around uh, catalogs. Now uh, for reproducibility. Now, uh, again, the same goes when you have data set, uh, there is a term in the machine learning industry called gold data set. Like uh, imagine you're building a fraud pr prediction system. You have a data set and you're trying to predict fraud. Now, uh, you really want to have a representative data set which captures a lot of fraud cases. And uh, we typically call that a gold data set. So whenever you have a new algorithm or a new model, you want to test it on this representative data set before releasing it to production. It's like your validation data in your software engineering. So uh, data and model catalogs, again, are very important to make sure your models are reproducible. Second aspect is transparency. Now, this gets into uh, the ML models are black boxes, as we know, but typically, well, I mean, the models like neural networks. So can we make them more interpretable? So interpretability could be something like, uh, so there's a nice chart by, uh, uh, by DARPA. Uh, there's a lot of uh, investment done by DARPA around uh, explainable AI. So what they show is as the model complexity increases and the, uh, the accuracy increases, your interpretability comes down. So if you have models like your linear logistic regression or decision trees, they are pretty interpretable. You can, uh, from the model results, you, you can know why the decision was made, what features were important. But as you get into neural networks, the complex uh, architectures, deep learning, uh, the interpretability is low. So in that case, there is a new study area of study called explainability. So here you build proxy models, which uh, tend to copy the performance of your uh, neural network, but try to give you some valid explanations, what features are important. And I'll show an example of a explainable AI model. So explainability, uh, interpretability is very important for transparency. And all this leads to fairness. You want to know why the decisions are taken and uh, make sure that uh, the decisions are fair, the right features are considered and the uh, inappropriate features are not considered or uh, and that bias doesn't come into your model the next aspect probably the most important aspect is accountability now accountability again gets into policies 
Now, this is an area where a lot of discussion is happening, even in the government government space. Uh, what is the what policies drive your AI outcomes? And uh, this is where uh, human in the loop is kind of uh, very important. Like, at what stage do you bring the human in the, in the, in the loop? I mean, do you want them to drive your entire uh, self-driving car, or do you want them to uh, want it to provide information enough for the driver to be smart enough to uh, start driving the car uh, um, better? And then uh, there, there is a lot of focus on metrics and monitors. What do you uh, monitor? Like I gave the example earlier, you deploy a modern production, the accuracy goes down. How do you uh, how do you first of all measure it? What metrics do you employ? And then uh, what metrics do you monitor? And then how do you control it? So we talk about data drift, conceptual drift, and I have a slide on that. I can talk about that uh, in the next uh, a couple of slides from now. And then uh, the last two aspects are around security and uh, privacy. Uh, I won't talk a lot about that, but that's a major uh, uh, development area. Um, this talk will be more focused on reproducibility and transparency, but uh, security is around uh, more on confidentiality and integrity of your data. So you, when your systems are processing data, you want them to be in a secure uh, environment. Uh, you have data in the database uh, that is encrypted. Uh, there, there's data uh, encryption at rest. And when you're calling the data over HTTPS, you have a encryption over the pipeline. But what happens during processing when you have a machine learning model and you're feeding it data, that your sensitive data is uh, in a plain text format is available to that model, to the training process. So that's where uh, things like encrypted completion comes into play. So there are technologies like homomorphic encryption, where your data remains encrypted, and then uh, the, all the processing like machine learning training can happen. There are other technologies like trusted execution environments, uh, which are more like in a cloud provider, they give you a hardware isolated space, which is uh, protected by cryptography. So you can, whatever processing happens, it is not visible to your cloud provider. So a lot of, lot of research is happening in this area. And then the second aspect of security is model security itself. Like, is your model safe? Like the example I gave uh, about self-driving cars, there are, uh, there are, there is research happening. There are attacks on the models, like model inversion attacks, where you can learn the training data that was used to train the models or model poisoning attacks. So when you're training the model, you may insert some bad data, which can totally damage your model's training performance. So that, that uh, gets into the security aspects. And finally, privacy, uh, uh, I have an example. Uh, I have a slide on uh, federated learning. That's an upcoming uh, area, and uh, companies like Google, OpenMind have been uh, promoting that a lot. Recently, there was this uh, uh, OpenMind conference on privacy. So privacy is very important, especially with uh, new regulations like the GDPR coming up in Europe. Uh, I think that the, uh, it is very important to make sure that you're uh, you are handling your customers' data uh, uh, in a uh, privacy-aware manner. So all the AI methods that you build. Uh, apply uh, AI algorithms you're applying, they should be also privacy aware. So there are techniques to make sure uh, either the machine learning is decentralized, like for federated learning, or you're introducing statistical noise so that the individual uh, individual outcome, individual values of your uh, customers are not leaked. You just work on the aggregate and the individual uh, uh, values are still uh, kept intact and they are not uh, available to the algorithm. So that's how you protect the privacy of your uh, uh, customer data. So that again, and GDPR has a lot of clauses, the, the right to be forgotten, where you can actually delete the data from the uh, uh, your existing data. So privacy is very important and uh, a major part of responsible AI. So that's kind of in a nutshell, the five uh, focus areas for, for responsible AI. Now let's get to, uh, let's get, get to see how, uh, uh, I can show one example of how this can be applied to your machine learning pipeline. Again, uh, this is not like the, the way to do it. There are multiple ways you can do it, but I can put show some best practices where you could apply uh, uh, elements of responsible AI to your... So this would be your typical machine learning uh, job. You have a data management where you collect data, you cleanse the data, do feature development where you do distributed training and uh, tune the hyperparameters and validate on your... Uh, uh, on your validation data set. And then life cycle and versioning. A lot of times uh, we see, we are seeing that not many customers spend a lot of time on this, but life cycle versioning, especially putting model catalogs, data catalogs is very important, but you may not have that in an initial, or may, maybe you have been using tools, then that's uh, that's really good. But uh, it is important to focus on the life cycle of a model because uh, the models de definitely tend to be dynamic. So once you deploy the model in production, you may encounter a data or concept drift 
end, you see that you will need to change the model. So you need to have a pipeline in place where the, you will uh, retrain the model and re, uh, uh, verify it and redeploy it. And then when you go to production, you can, can deploy the ML model either on cloud or on-premise, depending on your setting, or on the mobile device for that matter. And uh, you have logging in place uh, uh, to, uh, to extract uh, uh, insights from the model. Now, uh, this is pretty much in line with what we do in software development. So software, we have typically your agile or DevOps cycle where you, uh, 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 where you build your CI CD pipeline. And it's a standardized pipeline we can um, uh, powered by uh, technologies like Git, uh, GitHub, where you can, uh, as you check in your code, all the compilation uh, uh, linking happens and the model gets deployed and, and the code gets deployed. And typically ML model in those cases just acts like a black box. It's a binary file that you plug into your software and, and you deploy it to production. But uh, with the growing use of ML in the industry, what we are seeing is a need to have an ML pipeline. So while there is a software pi development pipeline, DevOps pipeline, we see a, a very much a need for an ML pipeline. And uh, this is some of the, so, so we see very much a need for an, uh, for a, for, for a machine learning pipeline. And these are some of the elements of a machine learning pipeline. Uh, we have uh, data management. Now this gets into data acquisition. Uh, uh, many times you get data from multiple sources. So it may not be uh, the, you may have to resolve the data. So this gets into master data management. You do data cleansing, feature engineering, generating labels. That's a, many times an important activity. You don't have enough labeled data set. So especially when you do with supervised learning, you need to have a labeled data set. Uh, many times you may have to synthetically generate data because the real data may not be available or may not be uh, possible to generate. And then uh, talking about data catalog, one of the aspects that we often miss out is versioning of data. You, you just have like a CSV file and use that to train the model. It's always recommended to have a version catalog. And there are tools like BBC, which let you build a model uh, data library, uh, catalog, uh, data catalog or a library of data. So data lineage versioning is very important, a part of data management. Model development is pretty standardized now. We have very good tools like Spark. And uh, below uh, on this slide, you see some of the tools. And again, by no means these are the, the tools. I mean, these are just examples that I have given. There may be better tools that you may be working on which uh, fit into this. But it's important to conceptually look at this, uh, these individual uh, steps like model development. AutoML is pretty big uh, today because you really don't want your data scientist to try uh, hundreds of models manually. So you have this uh, auto ML technologies, you have tools like H2O.AI, which is an amazing auto ML capability to uh, test various models and tell you how the performance of the models is on your data set. Uh, recently, I've seen PyCarrot, which is also a really powerful tool, which is more of a program uh, programmable approach, but it is very good at uh, handling categorical numerical data and it can uh, help you build an ML pipeline and uh, tell you uh, which is the best model performing on your data set. So model development is again the second major issue, uh, major uh, feature. And then model life cycle. This again gets uh, lesser attention, but is very important. How do you, uh, just like your data catalog, what is the catalog for your model? What that particular model that you're using, what data set, what version of data was it trained on? What algorithm was it trained on? And what was the performance? What was the test uh, uh, training data performance? test data performance and met, we get driven a lot by metrics but versioning is also equally important and finally getting to production deploying this model on uh, deploying this model on a production cluster and uh, that's where setting up a production uh, cluster and automating the ci cd pipeline so just like we have a ci cd pipeline for software developer uh, development we kind of uh, have tools like ml flow q flow which can help you build a ci cd pipeline for machine learning development so as you check in your uh, once your data scientist tests your model on the validation data set, uh, the, 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 the model gets checked in and uh, you can, it will automatically generate a pipeline, uh, a, a serving container, which you can deploy and uh, make part of your uh, software code. So this is this is typically the ML uh, uh, machine learning pipeline. So I just took a digression here to talk about the ML pipeline and some of the tools that we use. Now let's come back to our uh, uh, earlier diagram where so uh, we had this ML pipeline here. We deploy the code and then uh, we were driven by metrics. So typically we look at precision recall and the, uh, something like a confusion metrics, which tells you how the true versus predicted is. Now let's see how reproducibility can play a role in this. So look at the next slide. We can see the first aspect is what we talked about data catalog and model catalog. So when you have data, 
uh, you need to have right version of the data, a place now it could be CSV, it could be an S3 bucket, it could be a database, but a way to catalog your data. But along with that, you would want to have some insights on the data. So it could be a box plot, it could be a correlation plot. Like in that example, there's a box plot on the slide. So that tells you the distribution of the data so that you know this version, this is the distribution of your features. A uh, model catalog where your models, you can check in your, your uh, machine, uh, your uh, mo model files, and then you can compare what was the performance was. And that ties into the auto ML. So in the metrics side, you see, uh, this is a chart actually from PyCaret. So PyCaret gives you a nice, uh, 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 a nice uh, table which tells you for your data set what is the comparison of the different metrics precision recall f1 score of the world of the different uh, uh, algorithms like uh, logistic regression linear regression the standard mll algorithms and, and tell, lets you select the top performing algorithm so that so this cataloging and uh, your auto ml gets you the the reproducibility so now you have a standard pipeline of, uh, with the catalogs, you directly tell it, this is the version of data I need, this is the version of the model, and this is the auto ML capability I need, and it builds the pipeline for you, and uh, that gives your uh, machine learning model reproducibility. Next aspect, let's talk about transparency. So how do you add transparency? So along with metrics, we recommend you look at explanations also. Explanations tell you uh, a model why is it making those predictions? And this is just one example. In this example, and I'll show that in the demo also, we use SHAP. SHAP is a uh, shapely, uh, it's a game theory based uh, explainability library, which can take your machine learning model, take the data set and uh, run the run an analysis. It creates something called SHAP scores. And uh, using this SHAP scores, it can tell you what are the features of importance. So it can do a local explainable explanation. It can tell you for each record, why the prediction was made as a, <coughs> a true or false, or it could tell you for the entire model, what are the features of importance and by what factor uh, the features are important. So in this example, we are seeing the features on the, on the Y axis and the amount of uh, the bar, bar, the size of the bar will tell you how important that, that feature is. So that's about explanation. The second aspect on top there, <coughs> I'm sorry. The second aspect on top is about uh, data drift and concept drift. So when you have this model deployed in production, of course, you're logging the different results that are coming from the model. But at the same time, you want to look at data and concept drift. Data drift is when your features, when your model, when your data itself is changing. So the data distribution is not the same. So you assume that, uh, I apologize, I have to go on mute. Uh, so you assume that your data was following certain distribution like you saw in the data catalog, but in the production, your data is the, data distribution of the uh, the box plot is very different. Now that's a data drift and uh, such data drift needs to be detected. And when the data drift happens, you need to ask, you need to get a better representation of your data and uh, retrain your model. Second aspect is concept drift. Concept drift is when the relationship changes between your data. So you're, you're, you're uh, assuming that uh, the target variable Y had certain relationship between X, you build your model. Now in the real world, that, that relation is changing that can very much happen. So you, that typically you monitor it by giving an average accuracy. So over time, if the average accuracy falls, in that case, you, you may be feel having concept drift in your model. In that case, again, you need to have a, uh, your machine learning model retrained. So you, you either get a representative data sample from the production and add it to your model catalog by validating it, and then uh, retrain your machine learning model on this uh, new catalog entry. So those were the two main aspects from transparency side, looking at explanations and looking at data and concept drift. And finally, putting it all together is accountability. Now, a lot of these decisions, uh, you ideally want to automate them, but you really need an AI ethics committee uh, who can take these policy level decisions. At what level do you retrain your model? Or, uh, what is considered a data drift? Maybe some features are it's okay. You know you're expecting the data to drift. In that case, you don't really want to trigger a retraining. But certain features like maybe like income or um, like loan um, uh, loan amount, those may be important features. If you see data drift in those, you want to trigger a return. Second aspect is what do you measure? I mean, there are multiple metrics. So in, in healthcare space, we typically look at sensitivity, specificity, while banking, we look at more of precision recall kind of uh, metrics. So what to, what to measure and what, uh, what level? That's another something that AI ethics committee can, should be looking at. Uh, so, uh, so what I'll show is an MLflow pipeline 
So MLflow is one of the tools which can let you build. Uh, So uh, MLflow is, is one of the tools which can let you build a machine learning pipeline, uh, which can do a lot of your feature engineering, data cleansing, and uh, it kind of standardizes your ML pipeline. So uh, I, I won't go into details of MLflow. I mean, I encourage you to look at it. And it, it's just one of the tools. There are multiple tools which can do some, something like this, but I'm just it's one of the popular tools. Uh, typically, it just has a project like this, which is Conda ML is your file. And uh, run model is my Python file. I'll show this file in a bit. And what I'm doing is I have two versions of data. Ideally, this will be a catalog, either in an S3 bucket or in a database. But right now, I'm just keeping two versions of a data. The data sets is of loan approval. So let me switch to the data set. Yeah, so uh, this is the, these are the two data files. Uh, basically, it's just loan ID. Uh, this data set is picked up from Kaggle. So it's one of the, uh, the original data set I got from Kaggle. I have the link on the slides. And I did doctor it for the version 2. So version is the one is the one which is uh, directly from Kaggle, and basically it has things like gender, your marital status, dependence, education, uh, loan amount, and a loan status whether the loan was approved or no. So it's a pretty simple data set. Uh, of course, real world will be much more uh, complicated than this, but then just a simple data set telling the loan amount and if that application was applied or no. And then I have uh, made some changes which I'll talk about later to the loan status. Uh, which is data set version 2. So what I'll show is uh, this is your uh, typical MLflow pipeline. Uh, the YAML file is pretty straightforward. All it has is your dependencies, what needs to be installed. And the uh, uh, ML project is just the what file has to be run. And then uh, the third file. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, tool for uh, running your uh, 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 ML pipeline. All it is doing is it is loading your data. And I, I won't go through the code, but I just wanted to show that uh, it's that it's pretty straightforward uh, Python code to uh, analyze your features, uh, generate some plots, and these plots are being logged as artifacts. So the key thing about MLflow is you can do MLflow, you can log parameters. So I'm logging all this data model and uh, data catalog and model catalog as parameters, and I'm logging artifacts, which are charts that I have generated in Python when I run this uh, run this model and logging in a bunch of accuracy metrics. And uh, uh, also, I'm creating a, a SHAP explanation chart, which is also something that I'm logging. And I'll show you this in the report. But this is pretty standard in MLflow. You can look at any of the GitHub examples, and uh, this can do. So the, 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 the advantage MLflow will give you is, now I can go to the MLflow library and run a command like this. When I'm, when I'm uh, I give the folder name, I say I want to run it on version one of the data set. And uh, my experiment name, so I can just say here MQ. So I create a new experiment uh, for running my data science, for ML pipeline and run it. So what is happening here uh, behind the scenes is uh, MLflow is creating a Python virtual environment uh, with all the dependencies. Now, since it is created, it was very fast. It is uh, uh, loading the data set. Now, data set just came from a data folder, but uh, I could as well come uh, have it come from a database or an S3 bucket. Uh, it is doing all the pre-processing and cleansing, which uh, uh, which was a bunch of code, which I didn't go into details. It is doing the feature engineering, uh, doing some imputing of the data, uh, filling in missing uh, missing records, etc. It is building your ML model. Here, I'm just using a single random forest classifier and doing the model evaluation and generating explanation. So when I do a data set uh, version 1, I get a pretty good training accuracy of uh, 82% and a testing accuracy of 77.9%. So in MLflow, uh, what? Uh, so in ML, uh, so MLflow gives you a, a, a UI like this, where you can uh, you can go to the uh, the experiment that you created, which is just a category, and look at the actual uh, experiment run. So I can click on uh, uh, open this, and this is the MLflow run. So basically, I uh, had a standard uh, Python file ran the ex execution, uh, it ran all the ML steps of my ML pipeline and logged the respective metrics and artifacts. And at the end of it, on the MLflow UI, which is maintained separately, it is giving me uh, a bunch of uh, results of uh, artifacts that I had logged. So I had logged for this, my data catalog version is one. My model is uh, random forest classifier. I didn't change this. This is standard, but in the production environment, you would change this to either AutoML or use 
whichever ml model that uh, you would want you would prefer or it could be a custom algorithm that you have developed uh, it is giving me the cross validation testing uh, training scores and then these are the artifacts that i am logging so it is uh, it is giving me at a single place i can just look at what is the confusion metrics how is the accuracy numbers varying what is the numeric data uh, and what is the uh, shape explanation so this is the uh, so th this is the explainability chart so it is telling me credit history is the number one feature uh, property property area and uh, married and loan amount are also features this go into making a final decision on approval or rejection so that that was my standard uh, standardized pipeline and now uh, if i want to run in, run this on a on a new data set i just create the same experiment and i change the data set version to 2 so it is going to run the same exact ml pipeline on a new data set uh, going through the same steps and give me the results so what this does is um, it is an upfront uh, effort you need to kind of work with your data scientist to make sure that your uh, uh, data science i mean you, your data science pipeline is standardized but once you do that for any new data set like in this case uh, the version 1 data is uh, uh, is from 2019 and version 2 data is 2020 so maybe you are you had some changes in your production and you got a new data set and now you are comparing your version 1 with version 2 so these kind of things can be easily done i mean you saw that uh, while i was talking it ran this new model and gave me the new training and testing accuracy scores so let's go back to the ml flow ui and when i uh, when i click on this it had gave me a more recent run so uh, again it tells me this is with the version 2 of the data set and uh, it gives me the uh, the metrics if i look at the confusion metrics so this one seems to be doing better in accuracy it is giving me 0.97 normalized uh, accuracy on the true positives and uh, uh, 74% so it is definitely doing much better on the accuracy uh, it is giving me the data distribution uh, numerical data so looks like this uh, the new version of data set is good right but uh, so how about the explanations so let's look at uh, the explanations so now you see the change here so you are seeing uh, credit history still number 1 but now it is taking gender male as one of the factors now this is where the uh, uh, the explanations play a major role now this is clearly telling you that, hey the gender uh, which is male is playing a major factor in approval or rejection of loan that should not be a, a case now this is something that an ai ethics committee would most likely look at a report like this in ml flow or uh, the explanation chart and say hey this doesn't seem to be right and um, so then we can take a more closer look so what what is the difference between one and two? So if you look at one, and the and the reason I can point this out is because I I am the one who doctored this data set. But uh, in a real world case, you will definitely want to uh, kind of do spend some uh, time investigating this. So if you look at uh, this case, uh, in the first version, version one, we had an equal almost equal distribution of male and female uh, approval and rejections. But if you look at the new uh, data set. Here we are seeing a much different, uh, uh, a much different uh, distribution. So you are seeing um, a much more rejection rate in terms of a uh, female gender than the male. So in that case, this data set is biased towards the gender, and that is exactly what our explanations are telling us. So this, so uh, so again, these are kind of discussions is what we need to promote as part of responsible AI. We need to first have a reproducible pipeline. That can tell you exactly why certain things are, uh, why certain uh, decisions are being made, and then give you uh, put in front of uh, everyone, uh, the AI committee, put these reports. We shall tell you exactly why certain decisions are made, so that you can take a more responsible approach. That maybe the data is biased, and then there are there are uh, approaches to reduce the bias in the data. So you can have uh, things like uh, uh, undersampling or oversampling. Of certain data set you can even use generative techniques you can generate more data which is corresponding to the female uh, gender and then uh, that could be a, a way of uh, re uh, resisting this bias so this is just uh, i mean this is a, of course a doctor example but just to tell you some of the things that uh, you would want to look at and you deploy models into production so let me come back to uh, uh, the slides Okay, I, I hope you were able to see the screens and uh, this slides were just showing the same exact thing of uh, uh, how the data set is. So uh, I got uh, seven more minutes. So let me talk about the last aspect of it. So we talked about uh, 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 
we talked about transparency uh, accountability and uh, reproducibility the last two aspects i want to talk about is privacy and security and uh, i want to talk about it with respect to one example of uh, federated learning so federated learning is a very upcoming uh, uh, upcoming area in uh, machine learning and it basically talks so about decentralized machine learning uh, decentralized model training so assume that uh, you have a you have three different data sets on uh, three different parties so there's a party one now the party one could be a hospital or a bank or it could just be a single node a single raspberry pi or a machine somewhere uh, party two and party three now each of them have a, a good representative data set you would ideally combine them and build an ml model and give to all but because of data privacy reasons this this data set cannot leave the premise so the data has to remain at the party so what we uh, uh, so uh, what federated learning does is uh, uh, it trains a model an ml model on an individual party nodes so uh, it's is basically an architecture for decentralized machine learning and uh, a lot of these federated learning libraries like pyshift and tensorflow federated the way they work is you start with a basic model and that model is sent to individual nodes this model gets trained on the individual data so this particular model is trained exclusively on data of party 1 uh, uh, the party 2 model is trained exclusively for uh, data on party 2 and so so forth part, for party 3 then the model updates are sent to a central server called aggregator so the aggregator node will only collect the model changes so because i mean uh, i mean we all know uh, a model is basically a matrix of weights of uh, uh, of weights that help make the decision uh, uh, on the on the on the features so uh, when when we have this uh, the, so from each each node we'll get a delta of the model of the weight matrix and the aggregator combines it so typically it could do just a simple averaging of all the deltas and make a new model and that new model is sent sent back to individual nodes so the, so what happens here is we are learning by the wisdom of the crowd so each individual node learns uh, its own insights but these are not shared directly no data is shared from the individual node to the central server all we are sending is model updates and model updates uh, are trained centrally are uh, combined centrally and the new model is sent back so what happens is if you imagine this is a case of a covid hospital and in one region there are particular uh, the particular covid cases a new insights that are observed that will be translated to the model but without compromising the patient privacy those insights are sent centrally and those insights uh, the ones shown with the light bulb in the side are available to all the nodes all the parties so all parties can benefit from that particular insight so maybe that's a unique case of a covid uh, pa patient but without compromising the patient's privacy we can send that insight of the patient to all the nodes all all the hospitals uh while keeping the data private so that's the really the crux of uh, federated learning it's a decentralized machine learning approach and the focus is on privacy it is not designed for privacy it is designed for decentralized uh, machine learning but because the data stays on the individual node privacy is uh, comes along with it now the thing with it this is though the model updates are sent it is possible there is some research where you can extract individual uh, data elements from the Uh, from this model updates so there is something called model inversion that can happen and be, uh, because of um, uh, model inversion we can actually uh, be, because of model inversion we can actually see that uh, these uh, 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 we can actually go back and find out the what sort of data the model was trained on so in in uh, uh, so to avoid that there, there there are techniques like differential privacy which adds statistical noise to your data so you uh, so imagine this model updates coming to uh, so imagine this model updates coming to your individual uh, to an aggregator if you add differential private noise to it in that case these model updates are again uh, uh, made more uh, made private and then you it is very difficult to actually get any individual uh, data privacy elements of of any individual user so that's how federated learning works and then Uh, uh one one other aspect is it also includes security of the data because uh, there is a uh, there is a technique called secure aggregation which is basically under the umbrella called secure multi party agree multi party competition where multiple parties can share the data so they can share their model updates without each other knowing them so you, if you do a secure aggregation the party 1 
will not know what came from party two. And even the aggregator, the aggregator will not know what update came from party one. So you can securely share these updates from uh, by the multiple parties, and they can be aggregated securely to form your own, form your central machine learning model. So this is an upcoming technology. Google, uh, PySift, IBM have invested a lot in this technology, and we kind of see this as the future of uh, machine learning. Uh, keeping data separate, uh, decentralized. Because uh, when we go to our healthcare customers, the often uh, the feedback is, "Hey, uh, we have this data set, but it is private. We cannot let you touch it." But you take some MNIST kind of a data set and run a machine learning model. But that doesn't really help you in real world. So real world, you need to be able to run on run your ML models, train them on real data sets, and federated learning can give you a privacy aware way of learning of uh, learning insights or, or while keeping the data private. So there is a lot of work going on in this space, and we see this is major component of responsible AI. So uh, that was kind of the the main uh, elements of of this talk. Um,